Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Tanya Mel Talk series of today. And uh, please welcome Blair Newton, uh, Daniel Zeretsov, and Tamas uh, Darangi from uh, respectively Newton AI and Silicon Labs. Uh, the title of their talk is uh, Buttonless Remote Control Reproduce on Your Device. But before to leave the, to them uh, the floor, uh, let me first of all express a uh, lot of uh, um, thanks uh, to Olga Gorekmina, Evgeny Guzev, and Gianmarco Iodice, for, uh, which are uh, behind the organization of the Tanya Mel Talks with me as well. And in particular, this uh, series would be impossible without the contribution of our strategic partners, which I briefly remind the ZIP, Analog Devices, Arduino, Arm, Brainchip, Edge Impulse, Efficient, Green Waste Technology, Gravity, Hymax, uh, Image Mob, Image Mob, Infineon, Innatera, Not AI, NXP, PNG, PNC, uh, Polin Technology, Qualcomm, Renaissance, Schneider Electric, Sensimil, Sony, Silicon Labs, ST Microelectronics, Synaptics, Sintiant, and CDK. Uh, it's important to uh, remind that uh, uh, the, co the uh, community is uh, uh, also um, organized around the meetup. The meetup are organized uh, at country level. There are a lot of groups, uh, and the members are uh, uh, growing uh, on daily basis. And Meetup are a great opportunity also to have a networking, to exchange ideas, to meet in-person people informally oh, and because. around uh, tiny ML uh, subjects. Uh, the YouTube channel is an incredible source of content where to learn, where to keep up to date with the developments uh, around the tiny ML arena from the various contributors uh, and all the people, all the experts involved in the tiny ML community. The Tiny ML Asia Technical Forum, which is going to happen in person November 16 in South Korea. Uh, if you did not uh, uh, register it, please uh, um, uh, do that. Uh, and uh, we will be uh, very pleased uh, to meet you in person. Me personally, I will not attend, but uh, uh, it's great uh, to have uh, in Asia this event and do networking, exchange uh, your latest uh, uh, developments which are uh, amazingly important uh, uh, for the tiny ML uh, community. Then, uh, uh, please, uh, if you uh, did not yet have a look to the uh, 2023 AJI Technology Report, uh, download it immediately, have a look, because it is the results of a lot of efforts in preparing and shipping it. Uh, it's been an amazing amount of downloads so far, and uh, is uh, the first uh, in its count. It is a precious uh, resource for the young professionals and for all the members of the community that would like to keep up to date with uh, what's going on in TinyML uh, from a technology point of view and the various developments. And there will be a new update uh, um, around the TinyML Summit uh, date, so uh, around April to 20, 2024, so let me introduce uh, quickly the first speaker, Bla Blair Newman, which has uh, 20 plus years of leadership and tech expertise uh, in the field. Blair uh, provides uh, unprecedented insights into the future of AI development and uses. He is uh, the CTO of Newton AI and is engaged in uh, overseeing uh, business solutions and ensuring uh, high quality service delivered to uh, Newton AI customer. Prior to that, Blair had different uh, leadership roles at T-Systems North America, uh, part of Deutsche Telekom, responsible for providing the strategic directions and leadership in the arena, in the area of dynamic services, uh, SAP uh, uh, hosting application operations, uh, uh, infrastructure service. The second speaker is uh, Daniel Zerevtsov, uh, which is a machine, uh, a full stack machine learning engineer with uh, more than 80 years of experience in the field. And before to joining Newton.ai team uh, in 2018, uh, he had various uh, uh, roles uh, um, and executed various end-to-end -end complex machine learning projects in various domains, telecom, networking, retail, manufacturing, marketing, 
for detection all, et cetera, NLP as well. And uh, as the head of machine learning and analytics uh, uh, at Newton, uh, he's working on develop a, uh, or development of automated uh, tiny ML platform. I think he's going to speak about that, uh, facilitating uh, deployment on sensor and uh, for audio data processing. Active contributor of open source community with over 300k active users of tools, uh, feature review in his repository. An inspired writer, Daniel uh, published an article popularizing data science and introducing new methodology for solving uh, engineering uh, uh, tasks. The third speaker is Tamas Darani. Tamas uh, is the product engineer responsible for driving AI ML initiative at Silicon Labs. He is an MSc electrical engineer and working experience in various IoT focused projects in the past 10 plus years. Uh, ranging from IoT and Node up to cloud service product development. Before uh, Silicon Labs, uh, he had uh, engineering and product management roles at GE, uh, LogMeln, and the cloud, uh, Google Cloud IoT and Cloud AI. So welcome uh, all of them and uh, to you the floor, Blair. Okay, thank you, Danilo. It's always a pleasure to have an opportunity to see you and participate in uh, an event such as today. So as we kind of get started, I'd like to personally begin to kind of extend my thanks to the Tiny ML Foundation. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've had an opportunity to participate in this community in a number of different capacities. And uh, today we have a, a, a great opportunity that we're extremely excited about to share with you guys, not only what we're doing from a technical perspective, because that's just one component uh, of what we look to accomplish, but we also will look to share with you guys how you can apply uh, not only our technology, but also uh, bring this technology to life. And that's what we've prepared for you guys uh, today in conjunction with myself, as Danilo mentioned, we have Danil. Danil will be walking you guys through the solution um, that you guys, hopefully, once today's session is complete, you'll have an opportunity to replicate yourself. And we'll also be joined by Tomas at Silicon Labs, who's one of our strategic partners that we work with on a fairly regular basis. So, as mentioned, today we will be going over uh, one of the solutions which we've kind of coined as the buttonless remote control. And what does that kind of, what does that really mean? Um, and if you like myself, you guys are probably anticipating uh, attending the re most recent Apple event that came up where they announced a number of different functions and features that they were bringing to the market. And one of those uh, functions and one of those features that they put a lot of energy into is having the ability to be able to control your smartwatch or your smart device by just using your hand gestures. And when we listened and attended to this particular event, um, of course, it wasn't necessarily a new feature that Apple has uh, always provided or uh, that Apple was providing, let's say, for you know, their Apple Watch, but it was something that now they began to promote. And when it came to, you know, thinking about the tiny ML community, this is great for all of us, as when you have an organization such as Apple that is really promoting the value around bringing intelligence to the edge. Well, we kind of chuckled because we said, hey, we already have this particular functionality. It's something that we've already implemented and we've had the pleasure of implementing this particular function, this particular feature and solution as you will see uh, with Silicon Labs. So we're extremely happy to be able to share what we've been able to accomplish with you guys today. So as we kind of move forward, I'll take a couple of minutes to kind of introduce our organization. if let's say this is your first time having an opportunity to uh, interact with us. So I'm the CTO here at Newton.ai. My name is uh, Blair Newman. And we, over the last number of years, we've not only, of course, participated in this community, but we've also really 
felt that we've been instrumental in bringing tiny ML forward. And in doing so, we're not only talking about, let's say from a technical perspective, because as I mentioned, that's just one pillar of success. One of the things that we've been able to do that we're extremely proud of is we've really been able to kind of democratize the ability for anyone to be able to take advantage of this technology and really apply it to your particular ecosystem. So as you begin to kind of digest some of the things that uh, Daniil will share and he will demonstrate is we've had the opportunity to develop a zero code platform that really takes into account anyone's expertise, whether this is your first step in your journey or whether you've been a long lifetime member of the community, we have a platform that really enable and empowers all of you guys. We've coupled this automated platform with a unique framework that we've developed in-house. So all of the results that you will see today is not based on, excuse me, uh, a, a number of those different algorithms and frameworks that you may uh, be very well used to, such as TensorFlow. So everything that you will witness and experience today is something that we've developed in-house. And once again, really pushing that uh, theme of democratization and really being able to spread uh, the ability to implement such a technology and solution you'll find that all of our solutions are able to be embedded into any device. So we're a device agnostic solution, whether it's 32-bit, 16-bit, 8-bit uh, solutions. But one of the things that we don't mention on this slide is that, and you'll witness today, is that we produce solutions consistently that also can be embedded directly into your sensor as well, if that makes sense. Lastly, we couple all of these things that I just mentioned with services. So it's great to have a technical solution, but in the end, we want to make sure that you're empowered to be able to implement that particular solution and bring it to production. And that's one of the key things that we'll be describing today. We're not only going to take a minute to kind of highlight what we're doing from a technical perspective, and Tomas will certainly take you guys through that as it relates to uh, Silicon Labs and the hardware or the silicon that we're using. But Daniil will also then take you guys through step by step how you can then replicate what you will see today yourself as soon as the call is over. And for us, that's one of the most important things. It's great to have technology, it's great to have a solution, but we want to make sure that all of you guys are empowered to implement that solution and apply it into your respective ecosystem. So as we kind of step forward through today's discussion, I encourage all of you guys to begin to think expansively when you think about gesture recognition. And we'll put on display a number of different gestures that we're implementing in this solution, but begin to think about how it can apply to your environment whether you're looking to apply it to, let's say, a smart TV or smartwatch, or what about, let's say, from a heating and air conditioning perspective, the ability to adjust your thermostat if you're sitting on a couch or if you're outside of the room where your thermostat exists and you can just uh, apply a particular gesture and then you make the necessary changes that are relevant for your environment. And the same thing with smart rings and the same thing with smart speakers. So we will certainly show you guys a solution that we're doing with the smartwatch today, but we encourage you guys to think expansively as to how this solution can really apply to your environment yourself. So with that said, I'll take a moment and I'll hand it over to Tomas. And Tomas will begin to share with you guys what all of the cool things that are happening in Silicon Labs and also the hardware that we'll be using today in uh, today's discussion. So Tomas, I'll hand it to you. Oh, thank you. Hey, everyone. Indeed, it's Tomas Garanyi. I'm uh, working as a product manager at Silicon Labs responsible for the machine learning initiatives mainly. And uh, really thank you very much for the for the time of our community and uh, for the Neutron AI team to, to make this happen. I'm very happy to be here in this, in this session. Uh, actually, Silicon Labs is, uh, is is quite new to the to the TinyML Foundation. We just recently joined. We we joined the, during the during the last year. Uh, so uh, I, I I thought that it would be nice just very briefly to give an overview what is Silicon Labs, what uh, the company is doing, and also as Brian mentioned, would like to touch 
uh, the topic and talk about the hardware platform that the nice demo is really running on that you, you will hear after. And really do not want to take uh, too much time from the rest of the presentation, which is the meat of that, uh, so the, the demo and the technical part. So very briefly, Silicon Labs is a pure play IoT company uh, right now, or key strength and our key offering is all around the radio, the IoT radios. So you may have heard about all of these um, uh, different uh, radio protocols that are mostly used in the IoT space. Uh, so we are key contributors uh, in the Zigbee, in the Thread Alliance, uh, we own Z-Wave. Uh, we have a very, very strong uh, proprietary protocol offering for those who want to uh, do something uh, not uh, uh, running on, on these standards. And we we are we are also doing Wi-Fi and we have strong co cooperation, collaboration with the Matter uh, Alliance, uh, the Z-Wave and, uh, and, and the Cyborg, the Amazon Cyborg. Uh, beyond that, uh, we have really, really a lot of solutions uh, already on the market since the IoT trend shows that uh, this space is go beyond uh, the modems. So we are not only providing the modem itself, so the radio coprocessor, but it seems that there is more and more need for these really tiny ML solutions uh, where the modem, the wireless SOC also acts as the main processor or in, a, in an always on system, acts like the watchdog of the system and doing some efficient uh, wake web detection or some, some signal detection that wakes up the, the rest of the systems. And beside that, we are also actively working with all the rest of the bigger ecosystems. So you may, have, you may see uh, all products uh, in connection with, with Amazon Alexa, Google Home, Ring, uh, uh, Apple Home Kit, etc. Uh, so, so we are really a pure play IoT company. If you jump to the next slide, I would like to mention uh, a few more, um, a few more uh, applications, um, especially on the smart home segment that Blair mentioned. And, and it's really a, I want to give you just a justification why is it important? Why tiny ML is super important for us and for the IoT? As as I mentioned, uh, to use uh, affordable and long lasting products. So of course, if you have a wearable, if you have a sensor uh, device in your home, uh, and if you can do the job uh, in a Cortex M33 instead of a huge processor, that immediately has many benefits. Of course, the device can be cheaper. And everything could be compressed and squeezed in into the Cortex M, like Cortex M4, a Cortex M33 device. Uh, this, this could have many, many benefits. Of course, the price, uh, the system size, and if you have a very uh, lightweight, low footprint, very fast and efficient, smart, tiny ML solution, you can increase the battery life of your device. And these are what actually the customers are looking for. And this is why partners like Noiton AI are super important to us, because especially in case if you, if you, if you use Matter, uh, which is a relatively huge uh, radio stack, uh, can, can, can eat up the device very easily. Uh, you still can do a lot of uh, very nice applications with the tiny ML that only takes a few kilobytes in the RAM uh, and, and also a few kilobytes in the flash and runs very quickly. The device can get back to sleep earlier. Um, uh, the battery life increases. And the entire industry then shows that the on-device processing is more and more popular because of the 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 complexity reduces, you do not need to do complex provisioning processes, you do not need uh, to, to have like uh, always cloud backend, always connectivity, you can save a lot of radio communication, proximity to useless data. So on device processing is more, more and more popular. So this is why we are super focused on these um, IoT applications where um, machine learning actually is being run on all wireless SOC. And it's not just about the smartphone, if you jump, jump one more slide, uh, Blair, please. Uh, in the industry space, we also uh, also see a very, very uh, strong uh, demand on embedding the machine learning intelligence into the SOC. This could have many reasons. For instance, if you don't do not have enough bandwidth, like in terms of a remote uh, agricultural sensor, you might do the machine learning inference right there on the spot. Uh, the asset tracking, we already have a very nice uh, demonstration with, with Noiton uh, about the box uh, a parcel uh, condition tracking available on the GitHub. 
uh, the, the device runs for, from a coin cell battery and you can track uh, the life cycle of, 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 the, of the parcel when it's being delivered and just based on the IMU signal, you can track it was dropped, uh, you can track it was uh, transported by an aircraft, a car or a truck. So these are all super interesting use cases. It has to be compact, has to be small. This is where uh, the, the tiny ML uh, comes to the picture. And just uh, talking a bit about the hardware, uh, if you uh, switch to the next slide, Blair. So basically our uh, latest uh, and greatest AI ML chips we propose uh, to, the pub, to the public audience is the EFR32 MG24. Uh, that's here in the middle. That's a soup, uh, that's a 2.4 gigahertz uh, radio part. It also has a tiny AI ML accelerator inside. It's a Cortex M32 running 7 to 8 megahertz, uh, having advanced security uh, inside. Uh, can run Zigbee, Thread, Matter, and we also have Bluetooth radio. And if uh, you want, you can also run proprietary video, video stack onto that. The majority of all AI ML applications and demos, as well as the demo you are going to see here in this presentation, are based on the developer kit that has the CFR32 MG24 part in, inside. And this is what you see on the on the right side. This is a pretty handy developer kit with many different sensors on board. So it's very handy. It, it's a, it has a very small form factor. You can run it from a coin cell battery. Um, it's available uh, at each and every uh, bigger distributors, uh, or you can uh, purchase it directly from the Silex.com uh, webpage. Uh, basically, beside many different sensors, um, uh, you are you are you are ready to demonstrate uh, really really a lot of different applications available on our webpage, or you can check the latest ones. Uh, from the Noiton AI. What I also would like to highlight that a new part, which is being called SIW917, that is going to be the new Wi-Fi 6 part from us. This is coming in December, so it already has been announced, publicly launched the GA in December. Most likely they are going to have a very similar form factor dev kit with that part as well, so we are looking forward to have more machine learning demos in the in the Wi-Fi space, not only on the 15.4 uh, based radio uh, systems. And just to mention, we also have a sub gigahertz part already available, which is the EFR32 FG28, very similar to this uh, architecture with very similar specifications. Uh, this is sub gigahertz, uh, also uh, can run Bluetooth and proprietary radio. So this is the hardware you are going to see, and I pass the word to Daniel because the interesting part is coming now. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel. It's a pleasure to see so many people attending our webinar. So it's going to be a technical part of our discussion, and we got a, we got a few topics to cover. We'll just briefly, we'll go over the model results review on this slide. Then we'll show you the repository where this model is located so you can try it out for yourself. And then we're going to look at the live demo. I have got the model embedded onto the device that's running right now. Hopefully you can see the uh, LED flashing. And then I want to uh, say a few words about the effort uh, put into this model creation and uh, some closing remarks, and then we'll uh, uh, go to the Q&A session. So um, putting together the uh, hardware of Silicon Labs that Tomas has just kindly presented and the uh, new technology we've created this particular model. And by the way, this is uh, currently being used by the Silicon Labs sales team. So uh, they are showing their presentations wherever they are, you know, with style. So that they don't have to change the slides using their keyboard. Uh, now, regarding this particular model, so the, it can recognize six classes. Well, actually it's eight classes because the other two are idle and uh, unknown class because you don't want the model to false detect whenever you're doing something else other than you want the model to recognize. But the actual real classes that we uh, need to recognize and that will train the model to recognize uh, are replicating the motions that you might use to control different devices. So swipe right, swipe left, um, double tap, uh, then shake and clockwise rotation and counterclockwise rotation. And uh, we've coupled it with uh, uh, Bluetooth and uh, made it control, uh, as I will show you in, in a few moments, 
uh, either your PowerPoint presentation or your uh, music player. So you can increase the volume, decrease the volume, change tracks without having to push any buttons. And the practical application of this device, other than you know, uh, Silicon Labs team is already using it to control their presentations, but uh, for other uh, similar applications, you can embed this into a smartwatch, smart ring, I don't know, maybe a smart pen and use it like a magic wand to control any peripherals, TV, radio, without having to push any buttons. And if it is inside your, your smartwatch, your remote control from your you know, selected device is going to be always in your hands. Now, uh, regarding this model, as you can see here, uh, the model has nearly 99% accuracy and it's really tiny, only 147 weights. This has resulted uh, in the you know, very small footprint and very fast inference time. And this is basically, uh, well, um, how you can describe any Newton model. And uh, I just want to highlight that 4.2 kilobytes of flash usage is the total footprint of everything uh, because uh, uh, we can see uh, different benchmarks where other teams or companies represent their uh, their footprints of their models. But when you start to dig deeper and uh, figuring out that to run this model, you need an inference engine or some kind of library. And then you also have the code to pre-process the data and the declared size of the model doubles or triples very quickly. In our case, or well, in this case, uh, this model size of 4.2 kilobytes includes everything necessary to run this model. And if we compare uh, its footprint and requirements to the uh, uh, to this uh, the Silicon Labs development board resources, so as you can see in the table below, in terms of flash, we're using less than one percent. In terms of RAM, we're using less than one percent, and CPU usage is less than one percent. So basically, it's not going to notice the model running on the back end. Uh, now, um, a few words about, uh, you know, po popularizing this technology, we've created a repository. So this is the repository. And right now you should be able to see the link in the chat so you can follow along. So basically, uh, having a device like this at hand and access to this repository, you can today or whenever you want to really embed this model into your device and test it out for, you, uh, for yourself. And uh, the interesting part is that uh, it, we have used a limited number of participants to collect the data. And the model turned out to be really robust. Uh, and we are confident to put it into the open repository so other people that have not taken part in data collection can test it out on their own different activities. So uh, I'll just quickly walk you through this repo. So. Uh, First of all, here you can see how the classes or the activities should be implemented, like a double tap or double thumb, swipe left, swipe right, and rotations. And also here, an important part, you can see how the device should be located in your hand because the positioning and the orientation of the sensors matter. So this is how you should hold it. Uh, and uh, also we have a link to the video. We already done this uh, uh, demonstration previously, so you not necessarily have to look at this because you're gonna see the live demo anyway, but there is a link. Now, uh, some information about the hardware. So this is a very powerful development board and it's got lots of different peripherals. Uh, and actually for this particular model, all we're gonna be using this six axis inertial sensor. This is accelerometer and gyroscope, a little square, maybe two by two millimeters an MCU and Bluetooth, and of course the, the battery because it's running wirelessly. Now, uh, in order to embed this model onto this device, this is the software that, that you're gonna need. And basically here down below, there's a very detailed walkthrough of what you have to do to connect your device, flush your device with new firmware, and then uh, connect your, once the model is uploaded, connect it to uh, your, PC with the Bluetooth and how to influence this model. So basically everything that you're gonna need uh, to try this model out uh, on your own. Now let's uh, look at the live demo. So uh, I don't know if you can see me, uh, but for those who probably can't, I'm gonna use a different camera here so you can see what's going on. Now the device has two modes. Uh, you see the LED is flashing red and there is there is two buttons in here and you can program to the two different modes. So this mode is controlling the PowerPoint presentation. So let me select the PowerPoint presentation and uh, um, 
I'm going to, let me see if I hold it right, swipe right. Okay, as you can see, we're moving through presentation. So I'm swiping left. And uh, yeah, so this is basically how this works. Not much more you can do with PowerPoint. So now let me show you how to control uh, your stereo because there are much more activities you can use. So I'm just gonna push a button and start splashing green. That means the signal that the model is going to recognize as a particular class will be transformed to your music transformed to your music player. So I'm gonna uh, and uh, I'm not an active user of Apple Music. I have only one track, but this is more than enough for our presentation here. So uh, let's start playing. Okay, hopefully you can see the music. Hear the music. Now, if I swipe left, I'm going to go back uh, to a different track. Or if you go right, so uh, I have an empty list of tracks, but so it has changed uh, to the empty list. But if there were a different track, then it would start playing it. Now let's start once again. Now let's make it louder. Okay, excuse me. I guess it disconnected. Okay, small hiccup there. All right, so this is how this model, uh, well, basically running on this device without having to push any buttons, can control your different peripherals. Now, this particular model would collect the data from three subjects, only for, for uh, from three people, and uh, for every class, we've collected ten minutes of activities. Now, uh, I want to uh, say a few words about how this model was created. So I have a small different presentation here. Let me share it full screen. So hopefully you can see this. So uh, first of all, everything starts from data collection, right? And uh, uh, once you have collected your data, uh, it is, uh, it's not the time to train your model yet because, well, first of all, you have to look in your, into your data and see for different errors. So this is actual, uh, well, uh, plot of the data that was collected for this particular model. And uh, different problems can arise after data collection. So like idle intervals, like in this particular place, uh, which could happen if you have started collecting your data, then you got distracted and you know, place your device on the table, then you return and start collecting the data. So this is a very bad part of, of the training data. And if you don't clean this out and just label this as a particular class while the device was laying on the table, then it's not going to generalize. Or you could have data collection errors. Say you have done something which is different from what you intended. Um, or uh, one other uh, interesting example. So uh, one of our subjects had been collecting the data for, for actually for a different project. So uh, he has been doing that for 30 minutes straight. Then after we have looked into the data and in the bottom left corner, you can see this is what has been collected. So the sensor, I guess, um, it was a different piece of equipment. Uh, I guess it, uh, I don't know, went crazy for 30 minutes and collected this. It was all over the place. So uh, without having a look into the data, you really cannot train an effective model. So after your data has been collected, the next part is data sampling. Now, this is not necessarily uh, uh, important for some classes, like for a motion that is repetitive, like this activity, right? But uh, if you want to train the model to recognize something like this, um, yeah, so an action that uh, has a very short peak, right? Uh, so this is how your signal would probably look like, right? Uh, and uh, say a subject is collecting data and they go with, uh, as they think, the same intervals, repeating this motion and recording data signal. Now, after you um, have the data collected, uh, in order to train the model, I'm jumping ahead uh, and you'll see why in a minute, uh, you will have to interpret the data by windows because um, I have a separate slide here. This is how raw signal looks like. Accelerometer X, Y, Z, gyroscope X, Y, Z, and label. You cannot use a single row of data to train the model because this is just a point in time. And this could be, you, you might be doing anything else, anything at all. This is not necessarily means that this is class four. Instead, uh, you need to understand what is an appropriate window to interpret your activities, say one second. Uh, because in, within one second, like for this particular model, 
you can uh, uh, execute any of the classes you want the model to recognize. And in this case, the data was collected with frequency of 100 hertz. That means one second is going to be represented by 100 rows of accelerometer and gyroscope readings. Now, in order to uh, use this data, uh, this one training example of one second of 100 rows, you need to extract features and represent it as a vector, as a single row with a particular label. Now, going back to where we started, uh, if uh, we want, uh, and, and these are the windows of 100 samples. And you can see here in this window, the signal of the actual activity is uh, closer to the beginning of the window. Here it is closer to the end of the window. And in this particular case, you have two uh, examples of the signal. So the person that uh, done it uh, too quickly within one window. So this is not a valid, uh, none of these are valid examples for the model to, to, to recognize. Instead, for this particular class, this is how you should represent your data. So to resample it, to, in, to place the signal in, in the middle. Uh, uh, and for different classes, say the one like this one uh, at the top right corner, you don't necessarily have to do this because this is a rep repetitive motion. So after your data has been resampled, now you have to understand what features should you extract out of this 100 uh, second, uh, 100 uh, uh, record uh, time frame to distinguish one class from another. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason I put here four of these different different classes is just for the demonstration. And uh, uh, for example, if you extract the mean. Uh, out of uh, accelerometer, or, or maybe this is gyroscope, out of this particular window, and then you extract a mean out of uh, accelerometer or, or the red signal from, from this uh, uh, sample. And from four of these, you can clearly see the difference. Like in this case, the mean is gonna be around 3000. In this case, the mean is gonna be probably around zero, right? Here is also gonna be around zero and here about below zero. Okay, so this is a good feature. So from uh, accelerometer X uh, out of a window of 100 will extract mean and represent it as a feature. Now going back to the maximum value, for instance, this is also a good feature uh, in this particular case, right? because the maximum of this one signal is, well, about three and a half thousand. So, okay, uh, what about this class? Here it's about 60,000. Okay, so this one feature can definitely distinguish these two classes. Okay, what about this one? 600,000, okay, this one feature uh, can distinguish all three classes uh, from each other. And in this case, it's gonna be maybe under 40,000, very good feature in this particular case, which can distinguish all of these four classes. And uh, for this particular model I just demonstrated, uh, we've selected nine features and we've considered 30 different features. So this is a good idea to uh, look into your data, look at how different classes that you want to train the model to recognize represent are represented on a plot and figure out which uh, statistical or maybe amplitude-based features can help you distinguish one from another. So uh, after having that done, after having pre-processed your data and created features out of raw signal data and uh, represented each window by a vector of different statistical features, it's time to train your model. Now, um, I'm gonna switch sharing once again. So uh, this is our platform. And uh, of course, when working on uh, complicated production grade models, we are uh, uh, digging much deeper into the data, uh, but the platform uh, is used to showcase our technology and we have a very vast community, more than thousand developers using it all the time. Yeah, if you know what you're doing, you can build a very effective model, create all those features that I have just described without having to write a single line of code. So I'll just quickly walk you through this. Uh, so it's a main workspace and uh, it's tile based. Every card is a separate machine learning project. And uh, until they're here, until you have not removed them, you can always go back and download the model, look at the results, look at the plots. So let's train a new model. You just add a new solution, give it a name, and, uh, and click next. And from here on is gonna be just, you know, clicking the mouse and a simple drag and drop process. So let me just quickly grab the data. Here I've got a data set and upload it to the, to the platform. It's gonna take 
a few so, a few moments and while the data is being uploaded uh, the platform is checking the data for errors and incorrect data types because signal data well it has to be all uh, it has to not include any missing values it has to be all integer or float and uh, uh, so these are the main requirements and after the data is uploaded basically you can see here the three main steps that uh, the platform will go through while executing this um, this model creation okay so uh, one last thing on the data set tab is to select your target variable. It has to be a part of the training data set. And these are all the columns in your data set. It's the CSV file that I upload, accelerometer, three axis and gyroscope and label. So let's select labels. And there is much more to it. I'm just going to briefly show you the, the workflow. And we're done with the first part. We've defined the data set, we've defined the target. Now the training tab, quite a few settings here, but it's really straightforward. So uh, basically, we know this is this is multi-class classification because we have more than two classes. We want as a target matchup to use accuracy or any one of these. And uh, the important part. So this is a digital signal pre-processing use case. Uh, and uh, if it is the case, you should enable this uh, option here. And here are your settings. Remember the window that we've talked about? So here you can define your window. Okay, let's go with 100 samples. Very good. You can do a sliding shift to increase the number of your training data if you have if you don't have enough. But uh, if you have done data sampling before, just like in our example, uh, you should not be doing this because after the first sample, you will just you know mess up the signal being in the middle. But for inference, you can include a, a smaller uh, sliding shift so that it would try to predict uh, uh, more frequently when you are using this model in production. And all these settings that I'm putting uh, on, onto the platform are going to be a part of an archive with the model. Uh, everything will be compiled automatically. You can just go ahead and embed this. You're not going to have to set up all these settings in C or anything. Now, uh, the feature select, feature extraction. So uh, we've selected nine features, right? So uh, the platform is configured by default uh, to run uh, with with a set of selected features and uh, we consider this a very good starting point uh, but there is uh, really a lot which you can choose from and as you can see it's like uh, uh, in this case it has uh, it applies to all the six axes of your data you can always edit uh, and uh, we have even color coded them as light in terms of footprint and inference time medium and heavy so um, if you have uh, a very constrained device, you might want to use the feature, features with less impact on, on the footprint. And in many cases, you don't even need any, any heavy features to predict whatever you're training the model to predict. Now let's go with defaults, or you can even select all of them and use one of the feature selection options here. And it's got four different algorithms that will, before uh, uh, start starting to train the final model will select an appropriate subset of features that have the highest relevance for the for the model uh, so just, just disable this and last but not least a very important part uh, the uh, i believe blair has mentioned the models that we create they are silicon agnostic uh, so they can be embedded onto any mcu that can run c code uh, the only requirement is to select the the bit depth of the mcu so let's say we want to build the model for the smallest possible mcu and without flow data type support. So these are your settings, and that's it, start training. And uh, from now on, everything happens automatically. Now, uh, let's look at the results. And we're not gonna wait because uh, in this case, a virtual machine will be created for another five minutes and then the training will start, but uh, we can just open any of the other pre-trained models and uh, because this is basically, is going to reflect everything. Okay, so this is a trained model for human activity recognition. It took one hour and 11 minutes to train. And uh, uh, here you can see the settings. After the model is trained, you are redirected to the predictions tab where you can look at the analytics and download your model. So here at the uh, prediction step, you can see that all your, well, uh, accuracy was the target metric, but also for this type of problem for classification, we are displaying all the other metrics just for user convenience. And if you don't want to interpret these, you can look over here and see if your model is falling behind on a particular metric. Uh, there is also uh, a confusion matrix in here, all the usual stuff, and, uh, and a feature importance matrix. 
So one other really cool thing here is uh, you can look at the different epochs of the model training and uh, and see how the uh, the the accuracy was improved and and what was the number of weights because this is going to be you can translate this into footprint directly. Now, uh, why this is cool? Because you can download uh, your model from any one of these steps. Uh, in this case, uh, the model was training was stopped manually because this was more than enough, 97% accuracy. But uh, in other cases, if you let the model train for a few more hours, and as you know, the last mile is always the most complicated one. And here you might see another few epochs, which will dramatically increase the model footprint you know, uh, twofold, fourfold, and add maybe 1% or half a percent of accuracy. And this will be your final model, which will be a part of the archive. But you can always go in here and see, okay, so I can go just a few steps back. Uh, I can, uh, half a percent more accuracy is not important. Footprint is important. So I want this particular model and you can download it. Uh, and here on the right, you can see the footprint. And we don't estimate this. This is actually compiled for, in this case, for Cortex M4, and you can choose the M0 just for reference. And uh, in terms of flash and in terms of RAM, and it's broken down into the model, the inference engine, and the signal preprocessing. And uh, just click download, and the archive with the model goes straight into your downloads folder. So without having to write any code in one hour, in this case, the model has been created, all the data was preprocessed, all the features were created. The proprietary algorithm has been trained automatically, um, and uh, the archive of the model downloaded onto our device. Now, I believe we have a few more slides left. Let's go back to our presentation. I'm going to make it full screen. Um, okay, so yeah, the link with the GitHub repo should be in the chat if you guys are interested. And uh, well, what are the benefits? First of all, the models are ultra small. And as Blair has mentioned in the first slide of our presentation, up to 10 times smaller. Well, from the engineering standpoint, frankly speaking, many times we see up to 100 times smaller than the competing solutions. And uh, this uh, one um, fact uh, uh, can translate into many other uh, subsequent advantages. For example, with smaller models, smaller weights, smaller, smaller number of weights, small, less number of calculations. Uh, you're going to have a much more energy efficient model and you can embed this into device uh, that can that run on battery, like in my case, and it can work for, I don't know, years. Uh, also, uh, smaller models can be embedded onto the resource constraint MCUs that already have some sort of business logic, like, I don't know, uh, a, a smart ring might have very limited resources and it has to do many other things uh, that the manufacturer intended. And you might not want uh, or not have additional resources for some model to, to execute uh, all the time. Uh, and with, uh, as you have seen in, in, the, in the first slide of this use case presentation, with our model using only 1% or less than 1% of flash, RAM, and CPU, your device is not going to even notice uh, running this model. Now, uh, other applications. Now, this was just one example. Our model and our technology is working in many different domains, like gesture recognition, uh, so you can recognize what, what the person is doing right now. We've trained models. Actually, we've hosted a competition where people train models using our platform to recognize up to 24 different activities with the, with the MCU uh, on the wrist, you know, replicating a smartwatch, like activities like uh, operating a wheelchair, uh, brushing teeth, washing face, washing the, the table, um, drilling, hammering. There were lots of different classes. Vital science, determin science determination. So this is uh, an example of using other types of uh, streaming data because we're not limited to accelerometer and gyroscope. In this particular case, we trained model a model to recognize or to interpret a PPG signal. So if you have a smartwatch, you might have noticed in some models on Apple Launch Watch, for instance, you have a green LED shining on, on your wrist. So this is like a radar. It shines through your skin and it emits a PPG signal, which you can interpret and predict, for instance, breathing rate. Or you can predict blood pressure without having to use this clunky device, you know, to pump air in uh, on, your, on your forearm. Just 
uh, all the time, 24 seven is going to control your blood pressure. And if you are going uh, across some threshold, you can notify you. Human machine interface is just what I've showed to you on, on this demo. And uh, Blair has also mentioned, uh, again, this uh, Apple Watch killer feature that they have announced. We have this model for maybe half a year already. And uh, not only can recognize this, we call this pinch, pinch uh, activity, but also double pinch, clench, double clench. So this one model inside uh, an MCU, inside a smartwatch, can recognize with 99% accuracy four different actions. Uh, any kinds of human activity, running, jumping, jogging, uh, machine fall classification. So we've had an application of predicting whether the uh, tooth of a gearbox had been broken uh, based on vibration data analysis or asset tracking and monitoring. So also we had applications in the logistics domain where our models have been placed on the uh, fragile uh, packages that could uh, map out all the delivery cycles, starting from lifting the package up and, and transporting it by courier, then say the courier has uh, flipped it over and it's not intended to be flipped over. You have a glass vase in there. The model records that exact time when this happened and all the uh, time period where the, the, the uh, package had been delivered flipped over. If they drop it, two different classes will be recognized, a free fall and an impact when it hits the ground. Uh, and if it is transported by car, it is also recognized by our model. So the full life cycle of uh, package delivery is recorded and broken down into steps. Now, there, there are many more examples. You, should, you can just go on our website. There are videos and, uh, and uh, you, you can see all these use cases. There are much more. Now, uh, that's it. I hope uh, this was interesting to you guys. And now back to you, Blair. Okay, uh, thanks, Daniil. I believe this is the time that we will um, begin to take any questions and or answer any open questions that may be um, in the Q and A, if I'm not mistaken. So, for example, uh, some have been already answered. I see there are some open. One interesting question is what kind of ML AI algorithms are used, just neural network or also some other solutions? Yeah, okay. uh, let, let me describe. Uh, so uh, the underlying technology is proprietary. It's not based on TensorFlow or PyTorch. And it's frankly speaking, it's nothing like traditional neural networks because we have been developing it uh, for already five years with one thing in mind, uh, to create exceptionally small, tiny models for applications in MCUs. And, uh, uh, well, just briefly highlighting the differences. Consider the traditional um, densely connected neural network. Before, even before you start training the, the network, you will define its architecture and you will already know the amount of weights that it's going to have after the model is trained, even before you start it. And this is going to be a footprint. Uh, okay, so you've trained the model, then you you compress it, and then you prune it, then you uh, you uh, do quantization, and then you test it again. If it works as intended, then you can package this onto the MCU. And this model might have, and it will have, redundant nodes, the ones that are there only because of the architecture, of the initial architecture. But they might not, might, might not bring any value to the output. Uh, Newton does everything differently. So regardless of the number of inputs you have, it will start uh, automatically with one single neuron. It will connect this neuron to maybe all the inputs, maybe some of the inputs. Then it starts training those weights. And with constant cross-validation, which is also not uh, usual stuff in, in the deep learning, it will understand whether there is more potential for updating the weights or, or adding a, an additional neuron. It adds another one, and it may be connected to the previous neuron, or maybe not. And with constant iteration, it will start adding one by one additional neurons, training weights of only those neurons. And uh, and by the way, we are not using like a back propagation of an error or stochastic gradient descent. Uh, we have developed our own global optimization mechanism, and uh, with that uh, in mind, uh, after having uh, added a, 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 a sufficient number of neurons and after the model an algorithm understands with cross-validation that it's time 
to stop training because it's going to start to overfit. Then it stops training and you will are left only with a, a specific number of nodes where every one of them provides uh, an important input to, to, the, to the model prediction. And this final structure does not have to be compressed, pruned, quantized. We don't do none of that out of the box is going to be smaller than the compressed pruned and quantized model from, from the competing algorithms or open source. This is not available uh, anywhere uh, in the open source. This is painted in technology. This is why we have developed a platform which enables our community and any user really to leverage this technology through our graphical interface. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, maybe a question for Tamas uh, is uh, from one guy asking, uh, uh, if uh, OpenCV features uh, can coexist uh, on the MCU for vision-based controller applications? Yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, mm -hmm. just very briefly answering this. These MCUs uh, we provide are really constrained in memory. Uh, so practically, uh, just load the image, there is no sufficient memory. Uh, so I guess we can we can process like up to 160 by 160 in resolution. So it just really doesn't make sense to talk about this in terms of this uh, very constrained MCU. Um, and uh, on the Neutron side, uh, they are not really targeting any vision applications in that platform. And um, maybe another question for Daniel uh, or Blair. Uh, you mentioned the model is proprietary. Does it mean it's provided as a black box? Is there any technical info provided the compatibility with the popular machine learning frameworks? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to answer this. So it is proprietary indeed. And uh, when you download the model from the from the platform, it's going to be compiled. Uh, but for our enterprise customers and uh, uh, production grade models, of course, it's going to be an open model. And it really is uh, just uh, an area of weights and a mechanism to apply those weights because within the model, after it's trained, there is no know-how. Uh, the know-how comes when you create this algorithm on the fly without uh, an operator interaction. So, yeah. Um, thank you, Daniel. Another question for you, I think. Uh, I'm assuming new gesture can be programmed uh, in by the end users. Uh, uh, so I think the question is about how are the new gestures? Yeah, uh, uh, good question. So the the, uh, the repository that we provided is a model that has been already trained on the data our engineers collected. Uh, you cannot update it. You can only download it and embed it onto your MCU as per the manual. For the any of the new classes or other things you want to train the model to recognize, of course, for the label, for the Y, uh, and uh, during data collection, you perform those activities, whatever you want the model to recognize, and, and label this as, okay, I want to recognize this, I don't know, a triangle or a mountain, okay? So this is a class mountain. This is a class circle. So you collect 10 minutes of whatever you want to train the model to recognize, then structure it as one CSV with labels, and this is the data that you need for training basically any machine learning model and ours in particular. And I can also see a, a question regarding the axis of the graph, uh, the data cleaning graph. So the one I've showed, uh, yeah, the, the X axis is just the index. So consider a signal accelerometer for 10 minutes is gonna be recording some kind of signal. So uh, I just plotted the signal, all the 10 minutes of the signal. So on the X axis are just indexes, this is the first, you know, uh, one hundredth of a second. This is a second, and on the y-axis is a value of the accelerometer, value of gyroscope, and so forth. So these are the axes. And uh, one more question I can see: Can can these models run on Raspberry uh, Pi Pico? I uh, I don't see why not. Uh, as I mentioned, they are really silicon agnostic. They're not uh, geared geared towards a particular MCU. We have. And Blair has mentioned this casually, but this is really important. We have uh, embedded these models not on the MCU, but into the sensor. And uh, so it's a very resource-constrained device. 
Now, this way, you can save much more power and resources because your host MCU is doing some business logic or it's sleeping. If the model is inside the MCU, then it has to wake up 100 times per second, collect the data, then after the window is collected, apply the model, it's going to run 24-7. In our case, the model runs on a sensor and, uh, and it does predictions. So uh, uh, in most cases, all the predictions are going to be of a random class, of something else other than you are targeting. But when it actually, when it recognizes the event, it can only then wake up the host MCU, which can only then, you know, send a message, execute any other business logic. And in this case, say you train the model to recognize brushing teeth. It's going to predict 24 seven in the sensor, but it will wake up the host MCU twice a day in the morning and in the evening when it has recognized this activity. Maybe there is another uh, question, and also I have a question, but the time, the time is running out. Can the gesture model uh, be made uh, PCB position independent, or is uh, the orientation always critical? I yeah, think it's about the carry position. Yeah, uh, good question. So we've been working with the uh, smart rings, and uh, as you might imagine, you can rotate it any, any which way uh, without even knowing it. There are methodologies on how to pre-process your data and uh, specific sensor settings in order to uh, omit this problem and predict effectively on the data where it has been you know, shifted. So no, not a problem. In our particular case, it's a remote control. It's like a physical device that has the front, back, and the left and right. No, and, but we could have easily trained the model that would be independent. Uh, I have a question, a quick question. I don't know if you, Daniel, or uh, Tamas or Blaise would like to answer. I noticed your model is 147 weights. You know that I'm also chairing the on-device learning working group in TinyML. So a so tiny model uh, is also very low, low complex to train on the device. Does it make sense for your solution to go that way? So uh, well, support on device learning for such tiny models? It is an ongoing discussion and not only within our organization, but worldwide. But uh, uh, currently we have not progressed in this field, maybe sometime in future. Very good. So uh, there is another, uh, there are other two questions, but really I encourage you to provide answer to Olga and via forum so that uh, the, the community can take benefits. There are also explanation, more explanation to be provided. So I think it's a good opportunity to redirect them uh, through the forum. Uh, first of all, Blair, Daniel, Tamas, thanks so much for having devoted your precious time with the community to explain uh, what does it take to develop ultra tiny uh, machine learning model and deploy on efficient uh, uh, microprocessors, tiny microprocessors. You, you, your speeches were really great to hear, and I think the community benefit would benefit from from your time. So let me get the control back to the presentation in order to remind the last uh, uh, slides uh, in order to end the speech. Uh, Okay, thank you. So um, the, this was uh, uh, a fantastic uh, talk in the Tiny ML talk series uh, that uh, with Evgeny, with Olga, with Gianmarco, we carry on periodically, but obviously this cannot happen without uh, the outstanding support of our strategic partners. So let's remind uh, who they are, starting from the executive strategic partners, uh, and therefore Qualcomm, Syncant, the Platinum strategic partners, uh, uh, Sony, the Gold strategic partners, Analog Devices, ARM, Edge Impulse, Infineon, Innatera, Renesas, ST Microelectronics, Synaptics, and the Silver Strategic Partners, AEIZ, Arduino, Brainchip, Efficient, Greenway Technology, Gravity, IMAX, Image Mob, Not AI, NXP, PNG, PIMIC, Poly Technology, Schneider Electric, Sentinel, Silicon Labs, and TDK. 
uh, the video will be soon available uh, in the next days uh, through YouTube. Uh, thanks a lot for your time and much appreciated, Blair, Daniel, and Tamas, your uh, and also Kate, uh, your time in uh, uh, sharing uh, your knowledge and your work with the Thank you, Daniel. See thanks you soon. Everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.